Hello, everybody. Dr. Tim here, along with Hillary, our social media manager, and another version of the Dr. Tim's Aquatics podcast, Basic Water Chemistry, Part 2, Test Kit Basics. How are you doing I today, am, Hillary? I'm doing good. I'm looking forward to this conversation. There's a lot of things, a lot of questions that I, I think I had as a beginner and that even now when I talk to people that I hear people getting tripped up on. So hopefully we will be able to bring some clarity and answer some of the questions that people have. Yep, test kits are uh, necessary, but they can be intimidating. And there's lots of uh, myths like everything else in the hobby about them. So hopefully we'll clear those up today. So let's get started. Um, so test kits, there's basically test kits for everything, ammonia, nitrite, phosphate, pH, calcium, magnesium, just many, many things. They have some things in common that that's what we're gonna cover to have good techniques and get your best results. But the main thing is that these test kits, which what range from eight bucks, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, even if you get a handheld digital one, 50 bucks, they are indicators, okay? This is an ion chromatography. It's $100,000 that you're looking at in laboratory equipment there. This is flow injection analyzer, again, about $60,000. Those are analytical instruments. This test kits with color wheels or color charts are indicators with this Tetra test, for example, if it's yellow, your ammonia is zero or low. If it's dark green, you've got ammonia, you've got to do some action. So some people try to report, you know, I got 0 0.250 this or pH, you know, 7.1265. No, your pH is around seven with these test kits. <laughs> They're, they are not analytical instruments. Uh, and like anything else though, we, we need to know how they, they work. They're gonna give you a result. Even not changing color is a result, but is the, your test kit accurate and is it precise? Those are two different things. I wanna talk about that a little bit. So this, it's instructive to use a, a dartboard. So you threw four darts at this dartboard and you're terrible. You're not accurate you're trying to hit the bullseye and you're not precise, the darts aren't all clustered together. You're just random. This is Dr. Tim playing darts. Um, but then you have this case where you're trying to hit the bullseye, one hit it and the others are spread around. So this one is somewhat accurate. You're closer to the bullseye, but you're not very precise. There's, the darts are scattered all over the place. In the third case, you have these darts. They're much more closely grouped, but they're not at all near the bullseye. So there, this is the case of, it's not accurate. You're trying to hit the bullseye, but it is precise. If you ran the tests, you know, the darts say are a test, you're gonna get the same result. It's just the result is wrong. And in the fourth case is what we're looking for. This is both accurate, all the darts are around the bullseye and they're precise in that they're all close together, meaning if you did the test multiple times, you would get the same answer. Now I will say, oh, I'm gonna interrupt you real quick. Oh, For yeah, everybody no who is listening to this, um, if you want the visuals to go along with these and they're great visuals, I highly encourage you to go visit our YouTube channel where we have the whole presentation and the whole slideshow so you can see exactly um, accurate and precise, accurate, not precise, not accurate, but precise, and these dartboards. It's a great visualization of this. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a simple concept when you look at it this way. And the idea is you want repeatable results. If you took the, a sample, four samples and you did the test right then, all those samples should give you the same result. That's precision, but is the result correct? That's the accuracy that we're looking for. And next is units. And this confuses people and it's just, 
uh, you, this confuses even top scientists. And what I have an example, say you're gonna measure the length of an aquarium with a tape measure and you take your tape measure out in the example I'm showing, this aquarium is just over 14 inches long. Okay, 14 inches. Well, on another scale, you can see on this tape measure, it's about 36 centimeters. They're both the same length. They meet, you know, 36 centimeters, 14 inches is measuring the length. They're both correct, but they're using different units. And the reason I bring this up is that the test kits have different units. And if you can see this close up here in this example of the tape measure, that 14, you know, almost 14 and a quarter inches, 36 centimeters, exactly the same, just different units. And this is especially problematic when talking about ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate, because the test kits are based on two different sets of units. Some test kits use the ion. So ammonium ion, the nitrite ion, the nitrate ion. We're gonna deal with this in part three, which is advanced topics. And others though, use what's called the nitrogen base, where everything is, the, the measurement unit is nitrogen, which is 14. And what will happen if you have a nitrite test kit that measures in the ion versus nitrite that measures in the nitrogen ion base, one of them will say one, that's the nitrogen ion base, where if you're using the nitrite ion, it's gonna be 3.2 and you're gonna think, I've got a ton of nitrite here. No, your test kit is measuring in a different set of units. I've got a question for you here. Yeah. How do you know, I assume, and I, I've seen this on some test kits, especially if you read that little teeny tiny fine print in the instructions, is that where they should be looking to figure out what the measurements are? What the units, yes. Unfortunately, there are a couple of brands of test kits out there that don't make that clear. Can you, I mean, it's like, what? <laughs> you know, they, they don't. They just say nitrite. Well, is it, or nitrate? or ammonia, well, what are the units you're measuring in? And they don't tell you. So a quality test kit should tell you the units. The chemistry is nitrite. What are the units measuring in the ion base or measuring in the nitrogen base? And like, well, okay, what's, what, what's the significance? You've lost me here. This is confusing. The significance of this is a lot of times people are doing a fishless cycling. We covered that in one of the earlier podcasts. And we recommend adding so much ammonia so that it'll be two milligrams per liter ammonia nitrogen. Well, if you follow that through, the ammonia is gonna be converted to nitrite the nitrite will be converted to nitrate. If you're using the nitrogen ion, that two milligrams per liter ammonia nitrogen will, measure, will be converted to two milligrams per liter nitrite nitrogen, which will be converted to two milligrams per liter nitrate nitrogen. So that's two, two, two. It's just the exact number because you're using that nitrogen base. On the other hand, if you're using test kits that measure in the ion, the two milligram per liter ammonia ion is going to equal 6.4 nitrite ion, and that's going to equal almost nine in the nitrate ion measurements. And it's all because of the units. So this is this will be covered in more details, but just look at your units. And when you're talking to someone, maybe on a forum or, or you email Dr. Timms, we're gonna ask you what test kits you're using, just because that tells us whether you're measuring in the nitrogen ion or in the nitrite ion or you know the chemistry ion. And so let's, let's talk about some of the test kits. The most common pH. Basic thing, pH ranges from zero to 14. Zero is, 
you know, sulfuric acid, you just don't want to be there. But also basic is, you know, bleach and laundry cleaner, things like that. Where we want to be is basically um, right around between six and seven and eight. And pH is very important because it determines many biological processes. The pH will determine whether your nitrifiers are working. Because as we talked about in our previous podcast, if your pH is really low, below six, most of the ammonia is in the ammonium ion, which the bacteria don't use. I highly recommend that if you're just beginning out in the hobby, unless you have some extreme pH coming out of your water, don't manipulate your pH. Fish can live in that range of six to seven to eight and don't manipulate it because there's lots of things involved in trying to get your pH um, to change the pH of your natural tap water. So again, unless it's a special case or you're an advanced hobbyist, I would just go with the pH you have and not worry about it. But what you want to do is measure it because as the tank ages, your pH is naturally going to drop. And that's why you want to do water changes to bring that pH back up. Can't stress enough how important water changes are. Right. <laughs> I feel like I say that every single time we talk. Right. And we, and we get this question a lot. It's like, well, you know, I set up my tank and it was at 7.8. And now three months later, it's 6.5. What did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. This is biology. As we covered in our earlier podcast, the conversion of ammonia, which is coming from the fish, produces acid, which consumes your alkalinity. And once that's consumed, the additional acids cause the pH to drop. That's just the natural sequence of events in an aquarium. And that's why you need to do your water changes is to get that pH back up where the fish, most fish are uh, more health, you know, uh, healthier between seven and eight and the bacteria can work. But, but some examples, so this is the uh, ASF uh, pH test. And this is a, a color test. It's got an indicator in it. Different manufacturers use different indicators. And where you want to be is, like I said, between the 6.7 and 8.5. Here in Southern California, most of our water comes from the Colorado River. It's very hard so it has a lot of calcium and magnesium and the ph is quite high when you just go with it you don't worry about it <laughs> and i've kept everything from discus well african cichlids love this water um, but unless you're trying to spawn the fish or raise fry manipulating the ph is something you just don't need to do just change your water once in a while um, and you'll be fine but to give you an idea, when you say cichlids, now cichlids are a big family of fish, one of my favorite groups, because I have been the treasurer of the American Cichlid Association for 25 years. And you can see with, you know, quote, cichlids, you've got some cichlids, the Rio Negro, the pH is down around four to five. Where if you go out to Lake Tanganyika in Africa, the pH is 8.5 to nine. And there's lots of things in between. These fish will all do fine in that pH range of seven to eight. So don't worry about it. Now we get into the heart of the matter, what we call these color metric tests. And basically a color metric means that there's a color change. Your sample starts out clear, it's your aquarium water, it should be clear. And you're going to add some reagents, some chemicals in a specific sequence per the manufacturer. And after you add that last chemical, there's going to be a color change. And the more intense the color, the more of the chemical that you're measuring is present in your sample. So ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, phosphate, copper, these all are color metric tests. And yes, you can get probes, but those are more expensive and more um, involved. We're talking about a simple test kit that you can get at all your aquarium stores. And these are the most common ones. 
Now, here we have a little video and you'll be able to hear my voice and you can definitely see this video on our YouTube, but it gives an example of a color metric test so you can see what I'm, what I'm talking about. All right, this is an example of a color metric test. What we're gonna do first is the nitrite test. With all color metric tests, the more of the target chemical nitrite in the sample, the redder the sample. For nitrite, it could be green for ammonia. How you run these tests is you add reagents. They could be powder, they could be liquid. So for this, it's five drops. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Notice I'm holding this straight up and down, not to the side, not in the tube, above the tube, straight up and down. Swirl it a little bit. For this test, there are two reagents. Here's the second one. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Swirl it. You can see they, that one's getting a little darker. You just swirl it around. And for all these tests, there's a time period. For this nitrite test, it's three minutes. And after three minutes, you would then see the color change. Obviously, this one is darker, so it has more nitrite in it than this one. And you hold them up to the card, and you get a reading in that range to determine what your nitrite is in your test. This is an example of a color metric test where the in intensity of the color is proportional to the amount of the target chemical. So that gives an example of just a color of standard color metric tests. They all operate the same way. The reagents can be liquid, they can be powder. Sometimes like nitrate test, it's both. You add powder and then you add liquid. Pay attention to the manufacturer's instructions. Everyone's a little bit different on the timing between the reagents and most importantly, the order of the reagents. You can't reverse the order. No. So this is a typical ammonia test. And again, now the ammonia really should be, after you've cycled your aquarium, you really shouldn't be measuring ammonia. I mean, you, sh you shouldn't, you should measure it. It should be zero. Let me make sure you're, that's clear. We want you to measure it on a regular basis. It should be zero. If your tank's been running and your ammonia, all of a sudden you start getting ammonia, then, well, is your pH low? Why? Because if your pH is low, the bacteria are not going to work that convert the ammonia to nitrite. So that's going to be an indication that you need to do a water change. Have, has your filter stuck? Is it clogged up and the water's not running through that? You've got to bring water and oxygen to the nitrifying bacteria. If your filter is not running, that's not going to happen. Okay? So those are a couple of hints. Uh, now, some Again, as I mentioned at the beginning, these are indicators. And it's hard to sometimes tell, is it yellow? Is it a little yellowish green? <laughs> Don't worry about that. Don't fret. We get so many emails. People are panicking because it's kind of a little green. No, yellow, yellow, green is basically zero. You're OK. If, if, if in doubt, sure, do a small water change. What you want to do is if it's green, most of the ammonias are, uses reagents where if there's a lot of ammonia, it's gonna be green. If it turns green right away or after the three or five minutes of the test, then you have an issue, now you react. But don't fret about it's kind of yellowish green. The tests are indicators, not analytical instruments. I can't stress that enough. Yes. Um, and there's also some chemicals that will interfere with these tests. So if you add a bunch of an uh, ammonia remover and then go and measure ammonia just seconds later, that those ammonia removing chemicals interfere with this test. So you're going to get a false reading. It's not going to be accurate. Now, can I, so what are some examples of ammonia remover? I know um, CCHEM makes a product called Prime. I think that's very popular for a lot of hobbyists that they have prime on hand, but what are some other ones that would be those ammonia removing products? Well, there's, there's our, our aqua cleanse, uh, there's prime, there's Amquil. 
um, those, are, those are all the same basic family of chemicals and they take time to dis disperse through the water. But we, we get people, you know, they'll call us and it's like, I'm doing, I've added the prime just one minute ago and now I'm doing the ammonia test and they're all freaked out. <laughs> You're measuring the, you know, the prime chemical, basically. You've got to give these things a little bit of time to get through the aquarium. Um, in, in any situation, panic is the wrong thing to do. So, yeah. yeah. And, and so you just need to think about what you're doing. Uh, water changes, even if you have a little ammonia in your water, that's okay. If it's a lot less than what's in the aquarium, that's better than what's in the aquarium. The main thing is make sure you get rid of the chlorine and chloramines in the water, yeah. which is another colorimetric test, by the way. Your and pool. something to keep in mind that I, I recently encountered this um, helping a friend out with their fish tank is even if you do water changes, if you only do like, you know, a 10% water change and you retest for ammonia, you're still probably going to have ammonia in there because unless you're doing, say, like a 100% water change, you'll still have some residual. So it will take time. It's not an instantaneous, oh, I did a water change, so the ammonia should be gone. Exactly. Exactly. And generally, 100% water changes in it, only in an emergency. Fish yeah. don't like that big of a change, but sometimes you have to, or you have to get the fish out to, to a different body of water and you have to do what you have to do, but generally don't recommend 100% water changes. I think the only times I've ever done 100% water changes, and even then it was like 95, is when I moved and I you know, got rid of all the water and refilled the tank once I got to the new that Actually, Hillary, we, we should do a podcast on moving your aquarium. Oh, that's a good one. Yes. Yeah, yes. We're, we're, we're talking about things, folks. <laughs> but in the future, <laughs> we'll do a podcast on moving your aquarium. It's a lot of fun. I, I move mine cross country. So, yes, that would be no fun. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. All right. Um, nitrite. Now, nitrite is actually one of the more simple tests. And again, it's usually going to be some type of purple or red color. Again, you want you pretty much zero. And a lot of people say, don't bother measuring the nitrite. You know, you don't need to do that. I like to measure nitrite because I consider it the canary in the coal mine. This test, almost all the test kits are, are reasonable in terms of they will tell you the difference between zero, it's yellow or clear, and a little bit of nitrite, it gets red. Most ammonia tests, especially the cheap popular ones, will always give you a little bit of a yellow green and people freak out. It's saying I got ammonia. No, it just doesn't measure zero very well. Nitrite though, most nitrite test kits measure zero pretty well. And the nitrifying bacteria are such that the nitrite oxidizers, the bacteria that convert nitrite to nitrate, are the ones that are going to stop working first versus the ammonia oxidizers. So you're going to see nitrite generally before you see ammonia if there's something wrong with your biological filter. And that's your indicator. I shouldn't see nitrite. It should be zero. I'm getting a little pink. It's a you know, little red. That tells you, okay, I got to do something. Look around. Are there you know, lots of organics? Is the filter slow? I got to clean the pad, something like that. It's a good indicator. And it's a relatively e it's easy test. A couple of drops. It's the demo we did. You can do it in three minutes. You got the results. You know, I like that you mentioned the canary in the coal mine because... I mean, sometimes I think that I'm a lazy fish keeper in that I don't do all of the tests every single time. Would you say that you need to run all of the tests every single time or just a few? No, I, to, to me, pH and nitrite. Yeah, you, know, you, you know nitrate's going to be up, so you can do that with a water change. Unless you're getting tons of algae, what's phosphate going to tell you? Um, calcium and magnesium. You know, if you're doing a saltwater system with tons of corals that are consuming the calcium and magnesium, you know, that's a whole different situation. But pH, you're going to see that drop when it gets to a certain point as it's dropping, you know, you've got to change some water. Nitrite, easy test. If you see a little pink, you know, again, you got to do some maintenance. 
So yeah. those are the two as, the, as indicators to you that, okay, I got to stop being so lazy and I got to spend a little <laughs> bit of time with my aquarium. You're, you're, you're in the majority there, Hillary. Most people are, are a little lazy. They don't let their tanks take over their life. I like to be observant. If I see something going wrong, then I'm like, all right, I need to run some tests, but. Right. Or, or if, you know, if your fish all of a sudden go off feed, that's yeah. a real good indicator. And with cichlids, especially some cichlids don't really like the low pH water and you know, they'll go off feed because they're not feeling very well. And you can just confirm that in your mind. It's like, well, they're, they're not eating quick pH test. Oh yeah, pH is dropped below six. Do water change and they go right back on food. So. Nitrate, another test. Now this is, as we covered in basics one, it's the same color red. And what's happening here? Your nitrate, almost all of them, at some point you add a powder, it's a reducing. You're, you're taking the nitrate and you're changing it to nitrite and then doing a nitrite test. That's why nitrate tests have an extra step. So the nitrate test is measuring nitrate plus nitrite. To get an accurate reading, you have to do the nitrite test at the same time and subtract any nitrite from your nitrate reading. Does that make sense, Hillary? I think so, yeah. So, and this gets especially confusing during cycling because usually during cycling, you're gonna have nitrite present. So I tell people, don't even bother measuring nitrate in the beginning use this after the tank is cycled to tell you how things are progressing and really when you need to do the water change. Now, if, if you've got a saltwater system, elevated nitrate could be causing you know, algae blooms, but also what we see a lot is because people are so scared of algae and marine systems that they're trying to keep their nitrate at zero. Don't recommend that in saltwater tanks. You're going to get one of two things, cyanobacteria or dinoflagellates. And you really don't want to have either of those. And no. it's directly related to the lack of nitrate. Chasing that number, trying to get to zero, nature's going to come and slap you upside the head and go, oh, you've changed it. We're going to grow these things and you don't want to. So <laughs> nature's a whole lot smarter than we are. So don't believe these people that say zero phosphate, zero nitrate in your reef or saltwater aquarium. You're just uh, heading for trouble. It, usually you want, I say between 10 and 25, and unless you've got a really sensitive fish. And I mean, in order to get zero, you've got to really do a lot of water changes or add chemicals or bio pellets. There's just a an added complexity there, which isn't bad. It's just maybe that you don't want to put that much time into your aquarium. you are rather enjoy it and observe the fish. Don't worry about your nitrate when it's between 10 and 25, even up towards 50. Yep. Soluble reactive phosphate or orthophosphate. Now, people say phosphate, but that's not true. Phosphate's just the P. The only thing we can measure is the orthophosphate, the soluble stuff that animals use. This is a blue test. Usually you want this between 0.5 and one. A marine tank you want lower, 0.05. Um, but, but again, uh, it shouldn't be super high. If you're having lots of algae problems, sometimes people say, I mean, I've got tons of algae and this is at, my phosphate's at zero. Well, that's because the, the algae are consuming every bit of phosphate because the tank is overgrown with phosphate. Um, but again, it's, it's a test you generally don't have to worry about unless it's a reef tank and you're having issues in, just over long term. And the other thing, nobody's memory is so good that they can remember their water quality measurements from a week, a month, two months ago. Keep a logbook. There's apps these days, but good old paper and pen, a date, this is what I measured. Okay, that way you can see what's the trend, because that's really what we're looking for is the trend. Is your phosphate going up? Is it going down? Is it steady? Where's my nitrate? Is it heading up? Is it heading down? It doesn't take much and it helps a lot, especially if you're 
contacting like us to troubleshoot. We're going to maybe ask you what your history is. And we don't need it from memory. We need you to know, oh, yeah, I measured this this day and this is what it was. That gives us an indication of where things are going. You know, too, I love, I might be lazy, but I love my, I've got an Excel spreadsheet. And every time I do a water change, every time I test, I've got the date, I've got what I tested, what my values were. And then if I did a water change, how much? And then also on the side, I like to write little notes like, oh, I dosed X amount of this product or this, um, you know, I'm cutting back on my feeding, just, you know, other little helpful notes that if you were to talk to somebody else that you're getting troubleshooting help from, will make that easier on them. Oh, I wish everyone were like you, Hillary. <laughs> you, you customer service, like, I don't know. When did you measure it? Well, I think it was this. what did you put in? I don't remember. This is not going to be easy. You know, we're being Houdini trying to get information from people. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, it helps to keep a, a, a record. That way, also, if something happens, you know what you did. You don't have to worry about your memory. I added this. I changed this. I changed my GFO. Just something like that. You change yeah. the situation. We can look at that and help you troubleshoot. Exactly. And that's why you're doing these tests. Why are you doing these tests? To get a long-term pattern to know when you need to intervene to do regular maintenance or if something goes wrong, what happened? Okay. Next are titration tests. So these are different than color metric in that what you're gonna do is you're gonna start out with your aquarium water that's clear and you're gonna add drops until the aquarium solution changes color and then you're gonna count the drops. And so you're adding a base to counteract an acid. We don't have to go into that, but this is how you measure hardness, alkalinity, calcium, magnesium. So it's different than color metric in that the uh, number of drops you add is set with the color metric. You always add five of this and five of that and the color develops. With the hardness and alkalinity and calcium, the number of drops equates to the higher value. And I've got a demo here that I'm, I'll show you how this works. All right, this is a simple titration test for alkalinity, the buffering capacity. I've got my five mils of water. I've filled up the syringe to the very top one. And now what I'm gonna do is add drop by drop. So I add the first drop and swirl. You see the solution starts to turn blue. We're looking for it to go from blue to yellow. There's the second drop, still blue. Third drop, still blue. Fourth drop, it just turned kind of a yellow for a second. So you continue on. Fifth drop, there we go. The importance is always to go to the same endpoint. So that's the first drop where the yellow stayed. So that's where you stop and that's where you continue all times. For this particular AFS alkalinity test, then you look at what's left. It went from a full one mil down to about 0.9 mils. And there's a guide on the instructions. What's left, 0.9. So you have basically two KH or 0.72 milli, millimoles of alkalinity. Just read it right off the chart. But again, the importance. Oops, sorry, but I'm not sure right. that's short. This is simple. But uh, all these these short videos, will, uh, you can look at them on YouTube or maybe our Instagram page or something like that if you're listening and want to see what we're doing. But with these titration tests, you need to know your starting point or, or some of them, you just count drops. You don't have a starting point in a syringe. That way the ASF test do the calculations for you. You know how many mils you used and you look at a chart. Others, you count the drops and you look at a chart and four drops equals this. Either way is fine. Yeah. Now I've got to ask these AFS tests that you're using. I know a lot of people don't like using um, titration tests just because they say the color change is really hard to see, but 
when you go watch the YouTube videos, you'll see the color changes are very, very easy to see with these test kits. Um, it's not a brand that I'm familiar with seeing at my local fish store. Is it available somewhere online? It's, it's a European brand from our partners in Europe, and we've just started bringing them in. So they're available uh, at drtimsaquatics.com. And we're just getting them released into the U.S. because they're they're very easy, uh, and as you say, the color changes are are real easy to see. I mean, you saw on the video there; it went from blue to yellow, one drop, boom, and it stays. So yes, yeah, um, very vibrant colors. Yeah, very very different. So, um, like I said, we just started bringing those in a few months ago, and they're available on our site, and we hope to get those out to the market uh, in 2021. Yay, exciting. So as we talked about, alkalinity is the acid neutralizing capability. What, uh, we talked about this in part one. You're titrating this by adding acid to the water. And it's generally a measurement of your bicarb or carbonate, or as I like to call it, it's the Tums or you know, Malox in your system. And it's the resistance of your water to change or drop pH. And as I've said many times, Where's this acid coming from in your water? It's coming from nitrification. It's just the normal thing is that your water is going, the pH of your water is going to drop. And once you have no alkalinity, it's going to drop fast. So like if you're in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle, that water is a lot of rainwater. It's very pure. It has very little hardness in it. And so a little bit of acid and the pH immediately drops down below six where the nitrifying bacteria don't like. So um, if you're in that type of area, you know, where it has special water conditions, that's when you would use these tests or uh, also in salt water, calcium and magnesium are very important. And, and alkalinity, again, I'm showing from some cichlid uh, bodies of water that contains lots of cichlids. And again, you can see the alkalinity. Lake Tanganyika is almost up to 300. The Rio Negro has no alkalinity. Remember that pH? Rio Negro is around four. Generally, generally speaking, every general tip has an exception. You know, the higher the alkalinity, the higher the pH. Okay. Now, total hardness is different. Alkalinity is your bicarb, your car in carbonate. Hardness in G or GH, alkalinity is called KH, and this goes back to the German, but we won't get into that. Total hardness is you know, divalent. Oh, there's a long word, divalent cations. What does that mean? Well, they're cations, which means they're positive charged, and di means two, so it's positive charged ions that are two plus, like calcium two plus, magnesium two plus. But it could also be iron, manganese, strontium. So if you're adding, like if you're in a plant tank and you're adding a lot of iron, you may find that your total hardness is up because of, of the iron that's in the water. But generally, it's the calcium and the magnesium in the water that you're measuring with your total hardness. And you can calculate it uh, if you're doing it separately. So total hardness measures calcium plus magnesium. There's also test kits that measure only calcium and only magnesium. And if you take your calcium measurement and times it by 2.5 and your magnesium and times it by 4.12, that'll give you your total hardness for all the math geeks out there. And why is that important? I'll show you in the next slide. So water that's soft, very little hardness, we call that soft water. Uh, Hard water's over 300. Again, out here in California, our water's pretty much rock hard. Um, soft water is that water that feels like you can never get the soap off your skin, skin in the shower. Yeah. <laughs> here so in Vegas, we have very, very hard water. Yeah, Vegas has hard water. Pacific Northwest has soft water. Florida has soft water. Um, or if you're using a water softener, you're making soft water. So again, you see these hardness values I showed earlier, but if you look at how it's made up, you get kind of interesting, is usually calcium is most of the hardness. 
usually 60, 70, 80% of your total hardness is going to be made up of calcium. But if you look right here in the diagram I'm showing, Lake Tanganyika, which is over 200 milligrams per liter calcium carbonate hardness, the vast majority of it, it's more, it's 90% of the hardness in Lake, Mag in Lake Tanganyika is due to magnesium, huh. not calcium. Very interesting. I highly encourage you guys to go look at the YouTube version of this and check out these graphs and charts. Like it's really, really impressive. Like, you know, look at Lake Malawi, Lake Victoria, which are nearby. You know, Lake, Lake Malawi, over 70% of the total hardness is calcium. Almost 60% of the total calcium in Lake Victoria is, is due to calcium. 60% you know, of the total hardness is due to calcium. We're only in, in Lake Tanganyika only 10% is due to calcium. Wow. Yeah. So we'll give some hints on how to make Lake Tanganyika salts in part three. <laughs> We're not going to give all, we want you to come back to listen to the advanced topics, but exactly. um, there's some there's interesting ways, and this is the different chemistry to determine if you want to keep these fish. Now, can you keep Lake Tanganyika fish in Las Vegas water or California water all day long? They're my favorite fish just gorgeous and you don't have to manipulate it, but sometimes people want to do that for spawning or for some reason. Now, at the end of this, I want to give a little pet peeve and get on my soapbox about clean glassware. And you can see if you're going to do these measurements and they're going to be accurate and precise, you have to start with clean glassware. Glassware that's all covered in water spots and <laughs> junk just doesn't work. It, and so it's, how do you do that? Well, clean with hydrogen peroxide. You can go to the, you know, Costco someplace and get hydrogen peroxide, have a little brush and clean your glassware, the mm -hmm. tubes and things on a regular basis with hydrogen peroxide. Um, and then rinse them with distilled water. If you're gonna spend all this time and effort and, and use these results, you've gotta start with clean glassware, especially you marine hobbyists that are measuring phosphate. Phosphate is a sticky, sticky. It loves to stick to stuff. And then you do the test. And is did the phosphate come from my glassware? Did it come from my fingers? You noticed in the videos, I'm wearing gloves. I don't do any of the test ever with my bare hands. You're, you know, you're, you say that you wear gloves. I'm sorry to interrupt. No. Um, <laughs> it, it's funny. So like some of these, most of these test kits, they come with like little stoppers. And it's very easy if you're just trying to do a fast test not to do the stopper or not to put the stopper back on if you're doing um, a titration test in between each shake but do make sure to put the stoppers on your test tubes and please keep all the stuff somewhere where your kids can't get to it okay uh, there's small parts there's chemicals and you just want to practice safety don't just keep it under the tank where where kids can get to it keep it up high Keep it somewhere where it can be safe from your family, okay? And pets, and pets. And, and definitely pets, definitely pets. Dogs will eat anything. So will many pigs. <laughs> I got to see your pig one day. We got to we got to have a talk with him. <laughs> <laughs> so clean glassware. Um, you know, in in the lab, we actually for phosphate have a set of dedicated glassware that we only, that's all we do is measure phosphate. It never does anything else. And we actually keep it in an acid bath. Now th this is when you're trying to measure low levels. So again, these are indicators folks. When you're telling me you've got 0 .002 you know, two phosphate with your, with your uh, test kit. Okay, you've got super low phosphate, but 0 .002, I'm not so sure. Um, just and we do use uh, hydrochloric acid, be safe, goggles, glass, uh, gloves, things like that. That's why I have basic equipment, chem wipes, deionized water. You can buy that at a store. Safety gloves. Now with things we're going through, everybody should have gloves, glasses, and a timer. You know, like all those tests I showed, they all have a time. You're supposed to read at this point. And if you read early, the color didn't develop fully. And if you read late, say the test is three minutes, but you wait 30 minutes, 
Sometimes these colors develop further and you're going to think it's a lot higher than it is. Things change over time. There's a reason oh, yeah. they want you to measure within. It doesn't have to be exactly three minutes, but it shouldn't be 30 minutes or 10 minutes. <laughs> Wait till 30 minutes and see how much you panic at that color change. You're like, oh my God, I had to do a water change yesterday. <laughs> That's it. So in conclusion, I mean, don't, again, we've said this many times in this series, don't chase the numbers. They're indicators. Okay, and, and then if something's really out of whack, you know, all of a sudden, like I, I tested last week, my nitrite was fine. Now it's off the scale. You know what I do? Do it again. That's what we do in the lab. Don't Thank trust that. Thank you so much for saying that. <laughs> just, just hold it. Step back. Take a different glassware. Measure it again. Do you get, a, do you get the same reading? Maybe you were lazy and scooped off the top and got some oils. Maybe the glassware wasn't right. There just, there just could be something else. So before you panic, double check your work. We all make errors. Even in the lab, we make errors. That's why once we collect the samples in the mornings, we don't throw those out until we've got the measurements and everybody's happy with the measurements and they're in the logbook. Because if you got to go back, you don't want to get the sample an hour later than the original one. You've got your original sample. You can take another test and, and repeat it. Yep. And, and I would say 50% of the time, the second test comes back zero. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Except and for so, maybe like dissolved oxygen. Well, yeah, dissolved oxygen is a little bit different. <laughs> We can, we can cover that and advanced techniques on how to use meters and probes and things like that. I was going to say, if you're measuring dissolved oxygen in your tanks at home as a hobbyist, I will be very impressed. Yeah. So, so that's the end of our second talk on basic water chemistry covering test kits. We always appreciate you contacting us at info at Dr. Tim's Aquatics or on our social media. And thank you very much. Hillary, anything to add? I don't think so. If you have any questions or if there's topics that you would like to hear about, leave us a message. Let us know. We always enjoy talking to you. All right. Thanks, everyone.